Man, we really kicked the hornet's nest with that video we did the other day on the Black Ghost Challenger. Got a lot of views and a lot of comments, over 3,000 comments so far. And you know, it's impossible for me to go through all of these comments and, and answer each of them. But I had a conversation yesterday, a long conversation yesterday, with an old friend of mine who I haven't talked to in probably 35 years. And uh, this person is eminently qualified. If, if there's anybody out there who could be considered a Chrysler muscle car historian, it would be this guy. Now, I'm not going to tell you who he is yet. You are going to meet him. We're actually going to do a live sometime in the next couple of weeks. And uh, very interesting guy, very interesting stories. And he's tied directly in with Dodge. So we had this conversation. And uh, he reached out to me and we caught up on old times. And he was like, wait, I'm going to save this to the end of the video. Because this is the reason I'm doing this one as a follow-up. Not just to answer the comments, but also because another dimension to this whole story came about through my conversation with my friend. So I'll get to that at the end. But I do want to address some of the overriding comments. Um, so the vast majority of people understood what I said and agreed. And they're like, yes, this is bogus. Right? It's obviously bogus. But a lot of people took exception to some of the things I said. And, you know, I hate going to these places, but I was more or less accused of being a racist. Now, nobody, to, to, to the viewers and the commenters' credit, nobody actually came out and says, you're a racist, which is a good thing. I appreciate that. But... It was still insinuated, nonetheless, that this, quote, this wasn't owned by a black guy. I wouldn't have said anything. So let's set the record straight on this for, for just, just for the get-go, okay? Um, growing up, my mentors, the most influential people, my mentors, and, and people who I looked up to and followed and wanted to emulate when I was a teenager, most of them were black. Barry Pittard of the Mutt Brothers took me under his wing more or less and, and kind of like set me straight when I was uh, in my late teens, you know, put the right thoughts in my head. Barry was blacker than black. It always bothered me or, or it, it's always bothered me that some of the figures from that period of time never got any recognition. I mean, guys who were actually out there racing, street racing, these were true legends. Uh, Eugene Cord, Ronald Lyles. Ronald Lyles was like the first black pro stock guy, 1970, but he came from the streets. He was a street racer. Levi Holmes, another person who I knew back in the 80s. Fantastic guy. A, a, a true street racing legend. You know, never any mention of him, right? But this car comes out of the blue, the black ghost, with with this this whole story behind it. And you know, everybody bites it hook, line, and sinker, and then accuses me of a racist for calling them out. I, when it comes to cars, I am, you know, automotive culture, I am the least racist person you will ever meet. You know, I proudly say that a lot of my influences came directly from black drag racers, black street racers. So let's just put that in the past, okay? So now also there were a lot of people who were like, Oh, you know, a 14-second car. That challenge is not a 14-second car. Challenges. Hemi Challenger had to run 12s, had to run 11s. It was a, you know, no. I happen to know something about not only Hemi's, Hemi cars, street race. I, I, all of these things are very, very, you know, they're part of my, my history, my life, including a four-speed Hemi Challenger street race car that I used to drive for a guy. Way back when, way, way, way back when. I'm more than familiar with Hemis and Hemi performance and street racing and challengers. So allow me to share some of my qualifications to speak as somebody, uh, let's say an authority, okay? Let's, so let's, let's look at this real quick. So first off, This was a compilation. I didn't do this. I obviously didn't do this. Somebody else did this. This was a compilation of the 12 fastest 
street hemi road test times okay um and this was from not, not this picture this picture is just a random stock photo but in 1970 the June 1970 issue of Road and Track magazine, they did a drag test on a 70 Hemi Challenger four-speed car. They ran 14 flat at 104 miles an hour. That was the 12th fastest street Hemi road test from those days. Now, the fastest of them were down in the low 13s, but they were done by magazines like Carcraft and Superstock and Drag Illustrated. Those cars were tuned. Those cars were set up. Right? You've got other you've got other road tests like for instance, here's the difference between a, a road test on a Hemi car from 1970 the, the late late 60s early 70s 1971. Here's the difference between road test times. Magazines like Superstock and Cars Illustrated, uh, Cars Illustrated, I wrote Cars Illustrated, Mag and Carcraft, drag racing oriented magazines, always had the cars tuned. They were always set up cars. And they were run on the track. They were run under optimum conditions. And they would all find times. The quickest I could find was a 13 flat. No, oh, I'm sorry, 13.10. 13.10. The vast majority of these times were in the higher 13s, lower 14s. And the difference in between the magazines is that you have got a drag racing oriented magazine like Superstock and Drag Illustrated. They pulled out all the stops. Whereas if you go to the opposite end of the spectrum, you have like Car Life magazine where when they would road test a car, they would do the quarter mile times on a car. It was, they pulled the car to the starting line exactly the way they drove it off of the street and they just flat punched it and went, right? That was it. Because they really wanted to have a, a consumer oriented road test, not a hot riding oriented road test. So they tested those cars that way. And it would be, if you, if you look at comparison times between the same car done by Carcraft and Car Life, um, you'll find that there's like a full second of discrepancy. But staying, sticking with what I'm saying, and from my own personal experience with a, with a 426 Hemi 4-speed Challenger, dripping wet, it's a 4,000-pound car. It takes a lot to get the weight out of those cars. Um, I think the, the curb weight, the, the shipping weight was like 3,600 pounds, and then you add all the fluids and so on and so forth, and then you put a driver in it, you're over 4,000 pounds. You're well over 4,000 pounds. Now, as far as the, the performance of Hemis, I talk about performance. All right, so I happen to have a great deal of Hemi experience, racing Hemi experience. For 15 years, listen to me, for 15 years, the only Chrysler engine I touched were 426 Hemis from like 1985, 1984. I built my first one when I was like 22 years old and then raced them all through to the late 90s. Um, people like Lou Venonia, Ray Barton, uh, John Bauman, um, oh God, I can name them, were friends of mine. These are people I talked to on a regular basis back then. Uh, Um, this is Dave LeClaire's Native American car, and that's me. <laughs> that was, uh, this was sometime, I guess, in the middle 1990s. I spent 10 years with Dave and that car. I helped him with it. That car's engine spent every winter in my house, in my shop, because Dave had a one-car garage. The engine from that car spent every winter in my garage in New York, next to my fuel altered, which I don't have. Uh, I don't have any pictures online of it, but that's that's my fuel altered. I built that thing in my house in uh, in New York. Um, this one over here, this is this is a top fuel car that I, I tuned for a while. It's not just top fuel car. It's me pushing a thing. Um, that was the, the our drum ghouls backyard guys car. So I mean, I have I have plenty of experience with this stuff. Oh, and uh, and then this one, I was partners on this car for two years. That's Bobby Lagana, the Twilight Zone car. That's uh, that's actually us catching Shirley off the starting line in English Town sometime around I guess 1996 or 1997. So I mean, when it comes to Hemi's, I've been there, I've done it, I got the T-shirt. I am qualified for this, and to top all of that. Here is a drag test that I did 
There's, there's my byline, okay? Here's a drag test that I did on a 426 Hemi, an original 426 Hemi Daytona in 1988. Was this? When did we do this? Yeah, yeah, 1988. So this was a drag test that I did. I was the editor of this magazine. I did on this Daytona. And we went after after making after making countless passes with this car, trying to actually get it to do something. It ended up running a 1390 at like 103 miles an hour or whatever it was. Doesn't I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll go back and read it and find out how fast I went with the thing. But it only ran a 1390. Most of the passes were in the 14 second zone, 1410, 1420. The thing you have to understand about the 426 Hemi is that it was designed for NASCAR use. It was designed to operate normally aspirated between six and 7,000 RPM for 500 miles at a time. That's what it was designed for. Now, when you take this engine with its big ports and big valves and relatively dead combustion chamber, and you try to make it make power down low, like where a streetcar would have to go, two tons of streetcar with an engine that doesn't want to breathe until it gets over like 4,000 RPM, they're stones, they're stones. Street Hemi cars were not fast. They had a reputation as being slow on the street. A good running 340 car would run away and hide from a good running 426 Hemi car. The difference is, the difference is, the 426 offered potential, right? That's the difference. Offered potential. I got to go back to something. I got to go back to something. Talk about racism, okay? You, want to, you know, this is ugly stuff. I don't like to talk about this, right? But, okay, that's Shirley in the other lane, okay? You know, the world bends over for Shirley Muldowney and says, oh, well, you know, she's the first top fuel, first funny car, first... You know, no. Nobody ever talks about Nellie Goins. Nellie Goins was running fuel funny cars, was driving fuel funny cars. First female driving a fuel funny car. I think Paula Murphy was was really the first. Nellie Goins was right behind her. 1968, Nellie Goins was driving fuel funny cars. Shelley Muldowney was still doing dishes when there was a black woman out there racing fuel funny cars. And, and you talk about me coming down on this guy because he's black, right? All right. I lost, I lost my train of thought. I lost my train of thought. Oh, well, so, so th those are my qualifications. This is why I'm qualified to speak on these things as somewhat of an authority. A lot of you guys don't know my full history with this stuff. I'm, I'm giving you, a, I'm giving you pieces of it now. So, I told you I wanted to do this video because there's an extra element, something that popped up in this conversation I had with my old friend. So, back in 1986, I was, the, I was with High Performance Mopar Magazine at the time. I ran out to Detroit and we did a tour of stuff, things that were around. That's when I, that's when I actually found the Silver Bullet. Saw a lot of really neat, really rare stuff, I mean, extremely rare stuff, factory race car stuff during this period of time. And this is 1985, this is 1986. So my friend, who I'm talking to last night, says, uh, you know, I knew that car. I says, really? He says, yeah, I think I told you about it way back when. He says, okay. He says, yeah, we found it. We heard about the, this Hemi Challenger, the triple black Hemi Challenger that was in a garage. And we tracked it down and we got, we saw the car. We talked to the guy, we talked to the owner. I says, yeah, you know, I remember you telling me something about this now. He says, yeah, but the guy was nuts. He was out of his mind with price. He says, so he says, is this car for sale? And he says, yeah. He says, well, what do you want to get for it? So he says, 80,000 bucks. Now this is 1986. We wanted eighty thousand dollars for this car, and and the way my friend described the car, I know it was the same car. Even like right down to the the hole in the floorboard with the with the the stop sign or whatever it was, street sign covering the hole in the floorboard. This was the car, absolutely the car, and he wanted eighty grand for it. 
The original owner wanted 80 grand for it in 1986. All right. Now let's go to the Black Ghost story because I re this is this is like okay. When Mr. Qualls, the original owner, flipped the title to his son, his exact words and now linguistics are important. Linguistics are important. Words are important. Okay. When he flipped the title to his son, according to his son, he said specifically, he, he lack of mind, he, he goes on monetization, right? I have, I have to say this so, so that it, the transcript kind of like runs over it. Don't you get my fucking car away. All right? Don't you get my fucking car away. Now, what did he say there? He didn't say, don't sell my car. He never said, don't sell my car. He said, don't give my car away. So in 1985, he would have taken $80,000 for this car. Now, in 1985, a car in similar condition was probably only worth maybe $20,000, $15,000 to $20,000. I bought at that time, I, had, I bought a 66 Hemi Satellite in about that condition for 600 bucks. I bought a 71 Hemi Super B without an engine for 600 bucks, right? They're all in this period of time. So that car, triple black RT SE four speed, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you know, it was a valuable car, but nowhere near. And then on top of that, right about that time, maybe a couple of years after, John Bauman, the super stock Hemi car, he offered me a 1970 Hemi Challenger's automatic car. It was used as a guy's daily driver, had over 100,000 miles on it for 22,000. And this was a complete turnkey car, like ready to go. Just get in it, turn the key, and drive. So, what I'm, the point I'm trying to get at is, Mr. Qual Sr. had very high expectations of what this car was worth. And he wasn't telling his son, don't sell my car. He was telling his son, don't give my car away. Meaning that, get top dollar for this. This is like the family, this is, this is your inheritance. This is an inheritance. You see what I'm saying? Not don't sell my car. I don't think he really cared if, if the car was gonna get sold or not. He was about to pass on to the next realm. It means nothing to him. He saw a tremendous dollar value in the car and then passed it along with those words. Don't give my car away. Okay? Do you see the difference? What's the car worth? What do I feel the car is worth? Honestly, it needs a full restoration. If you go through the car. Oh, there's one other thing too. A lot of people speculated that, well, maybe, maybe he raced the car and then put all of the stock parts back on it. Mr. Qualls was not a mechanic. Now, according to the story, as told by his son and, and the people around him, uh, Mr. Qualls was not a mechanic. The car stopped running and he parked it. Around 1985, around the time that my friend had found this car, made an offer on it, or, or tried to make an offer on it, that car was brought to, quote, a mechanic to figure out what was wrong with it and get it running. Now, and at that point, and these are, watch, watch the videos, there's, there's countless black ghost videos out there. Watch and read the accounts of, watch the accounts of what was, what was said. He brought the car to a mechanic. The mechanic said, this thing is original. It's never been apart. The valve covers have never been off. They're all original gaskets, quote the mechanic. They got the car running. But Mr. Qualls was not a mechanic. He, he had no ability to take this car, do all kinds of crazy stuff to it, go out and challenge the hitters, you know, and make a legend for himself and, and you know, then return everything to stock. It was not like that. He bought the car, he daily drove the car, he racked up some miles, some hard miles on this thing. He, I'm sure he street raced it. There's no question about it. There's no doubt, no doubt about it. He street raced it. But it was a completely stock car and he was street racing against other comparatively stock cars. That is not what a legend is made of. That's what a story is made of. It's a great family story, you know, but it's not, it's not what a legend is made of. 
Uh, if you want to talk about legends, there are legends out there. There, there are people who deserve to be recognized, the people who deserve the credit due because they were pioneers or because they were exceptionally good at what they did. And a lot of them, I mean, they were black. There were a lot of black guys out there that were really doing stuff. Mr. Qualls was was a good person. He, I, I say, I say nothing bad about him at all. But he was not a street racing legend. In fact, the only if you go through, I've been living in Black Ghost world now for the last couple of days. The only eyewitness accounts of this car actually street racing come from Mr. Qualls' friend. I can't think of the gentleman's name off the top of my head, but this is the same guy that claimed that he rode with him when they street raced and he would tell him when to shift. I, I can't make this stuff up. That is the only eyewitness account. Find another one if, if, you, if you doubt me. It was the only eyewitness account of this car actually going out and street racing back in the day. Everything else is just fantasy. All right. I covered a lot of ground with this. And I'm, and I'm going to leave it at that. And I don't want to do any more black ghost stuff. But I, I, you are going to meet my friend um, within the next week or two. We're going to do a live together. And, and it ought to be interesting. Not, not about necessarily about the black ghost, but just about Chrysler racing and street racing history and, and how the engineers were involved and all of this stuff. This is a person who, has, who knew all of these people, who worked with all of these people, and knows all of those stories. Great, fascinating stuff. I can't wait to introduce them to you guys. So that's it for now. I'll see you tomorrow.